Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter, and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where you are and what time it is. If you guys are on the podcast, maybe you're watching the replay, I just want you to know that I love you, I honor you, and I'm so thankful and grateful that uh, you guys are taking time to catch up or to listen in. What is up, Brother Gary? Good morning, good morning. Brother Fred, I see you. Good morning. God bless you guys coming in. So where are you guys from? I got my Aussies in the house. Houston, Texas is in the house. I love to see it. North Carolina. I know it's Eastern time over there. It's a little bit later today. Miami, Austin, Texas. More Aussies coming in, man. I need to take a trip out to Australia is what I need to do. My Aussies and my my the people from the UK, you guys are coming in strong. Uh, good morning. So check it out. Look, I just wanted to say that um, I'm, I love you guys. I honor you. I'm so thankful and grateful. We are wrapping up the book of Hebrews today. Our, our scripture is found in Hebrews 13. Their sister may with it. Uh, always consistent. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, Genesis chapter 24. Uh, Hebrews has been amazing. I love the, the second half of Hebrews. The first half is kind of building up. It's really making this distinction between Christ and the Old Testament figures, allowing him to stand aside, really to stand alone. But there's so much more practical application in the last part of Hebrews. So today uh, we're going to do a little digital altar call at the end of our time together. And Genesis 24 is just kind of like this fairy tale love story, the beginning of it. Um, I know some of you guys probably got a little Twitter page. Those of you in your single season, I'm not poking fun, but you're just like, oh, I wish that I could have my Rebecca. You know, I wish that I would be swept off my feet and, you know, somebody would arise and bring 10 camels in order to, you know, take me from my family and rescue me and whisk me off to a new land and put gold bracelets on my wrists and a gold ring in my nose. You know, uh, we'll go over it. But there's something else that stood out to me in Genesis chapter 24 that, um, you might have overlooked, but it was evident to me. So I want to pray. We'll jump into Hebrews. We'll swing over to Genesis, and uh, we're going to have an amazing day. Some of y'all said, no, thank you. I do not want to ride on a camel. I do not. I love my season of singleness. I'm all by myself. I get to go to the movie solo, and uh, I, I love that for you. Honestly, when I was in my season of singleness, I would go on hikes. There was a lot of things that I would do on my own and um, really thrived in that time. And I would encourage you guys to do the same. We'll talk about that in Hebrews. So let's pray and uh, let's jump into the scripture. So Heavenly Father, we're so honored, so just absolutely thankful um, that you show up day in, day out, that you are consistent. You are a rock. You, Lord, as the scripture will tell us today, are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not change. You, you are always with us, even in the bad times, even in the sad times, even in the middle of the chaos and storms. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And we are so honored and privileged to know you, uh, to know uh, just who you are, Lord, and, and who you say that we are. Help us to walk in that boldness, confidence, and authority that we have and that comes from the word, Lord. We don't boast in ourselves or in our own, uh, our own talents or our own giftings. It's not by might. It's not by our own strength, Lord. It's all by you. You are our strength. You are our peace. You, Lord, are our comfort. You are everything that we truly need. We find it all in you. So as we enter into this place, God, prepare our hearts. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And really help us to leave this place changed and transformed. God, we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Uh, so check it out. Right out the gate. Verse 1 says, hey, keep on loving each other. Right at the end of 12, we're kind of, uh, we're talking about being careful about how you live right? Knowing uh, the direction in verse 28 of the last chapter, kind of just recapping as we scroll into uh, this verse one, it says, so let us be thankful because we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We should worship God in a way that pleases him with respect and fear because our God is like a fire that burns things up. And then he says, verse one of chapter 13, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. 
Remember to welcome strangers because some of you have done this and have welcomed angels without even knowing. I believe that this still stands true. I think that this holds true still. Uh, many times, you know, I, I believe that they, we will be visited by heavenly creatures and heavenly beings, angels, um, and not even know it. And sometimes I think that it's, it might be a testing of our heart posture, right? The, the person who comes up to you who is covered in filth and grime and might not smell the greatest but needs something from you. As we back off repulsively or we are mean to them or we reject them or we push them away, you know, how are we treating the least of these? How are we treating those who are in a position to not benefit us, right? It's easy. It even says in scripture, it's easy to be nice to people who are nice to you. It's easy to be kind to people who are going to benefit you. It's easy to be loving and caring to somebody who has something to offer you. But what about the least of these? What about those who have nothing? nothing to offer you, that they, they have nothing to, to really advance you. They, they, they have nothing to give to you in return. How do you treat those who are less fortunate? Are, are you repulsed by them? Do you push them away? Are you judgmental? Do you cross the street and go to the other side? Or do you look at them with love and empathy? Do you realize that you, you could be just a few bad decisions away from being in that same position? I, I, I don't say that to guilt trip. I say that because there's so much reality. You know, we go down to Skid Row when we can. It's usually every week or every other weekend. Uh, and we do our best just to relate, to to feed the unhoused. And it's not our food. It's not, it's not our program. We go and we join in with other programs. But I like being at the front of the line because I get to interact with people. I get to talk with them. And they usually comment on my Christian shirt or hat or, you know, we spark up these very small conversations and you don't know the power of a smile. Sometimes just smiling at somebody and looking them in their eyes and talking to them like they're a human being. Many of these people get talked to as if they're trash or as if they're subhuman, like as if they're not real. They don't have feelings or emotions. Uh, many people think that everybody's homeless because of drugs uh, or everybody's homeless because they're lazy. It couldn't be further from the truth. I think that sometimes we could be visited by like by angels. We could be being tested. I, I, I never let that slip my mind. So so if I have something and somebody, you know, off, it comes up to me, I'm mindful that, hey, man, I'm going to do this to the least of these. They might not have anything to offer me, nothing to give back to me, but I'm going to give you what I got. Whatever it is, if it's within my power, it's yours, right? It's yours. And so it's just one of those things. It just reminds me of that. And I pray that we keep that at the forefront of our mind and the forefront of our heart, that as we are interacting with people, um, regardless of, and, and I, I get it, it's not always easy. Right? It's not always easy. I can see how sometimes it can be challenging. Sometimes your first or initial reaction you meet might be caught off guard. But uh, again, man, empathy and love. It says, look, to keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Um, remember to welcome strangers. I love verse three. Remember those who are in prison uh, and, and remember those who are suffering. Understand, you know, go to prisons, visit them send them letters, you know, try to, to, to interact with these people who are in places that are, are hurting, that are lost, uh, you know, be that light in the dark world. This is just a reminder, man, that, you know, we do have a very short amount of time here on this earth and it is our absolute privilege to be a light. It's our, our, oof, that's good. I just read a comment says everyone is one tragedy away from bankruptcy, right? Uh, that holds true for a lot of people. A lot of people. I've actually, in my 37 years, uh, before I was 30 years old, I filed for bankruptcy twice. That's why I was talking about the other day, being familiar with the repo man, right? Getting myself into financial situations and, and having kids and, and medical bills and school and things that were over my head. I got in over my head and managed my funds poorly. It wasn't because I was lazy. You guys can tell I'm not lazy. I worked hard, but I made poor decisions. And then, uh, you know, some things popped up as far as like having kids and one of them was premature and some of the doctor bills and expenses became far more than my medical would cover. And there was X amount of money that had to come out of pocket. And it's like, it's a kid that needs to live and need, you know, it's premature. So, you know, found myself in situations that were overwhelming. And I always remind myself that I could be one poor decision, one tragic accident, one mishap away from being in that same place. I think a lot of us overlook that. Um, but that's a whole topic. We could get into so much depth when it comes to that. Uh, moving forward, verse four says, marriage should be honored by everyone. 
Um, and husband and wife should keep their marriage pure. Uh, this is like the third time that they talk briefly about sexual sin. I, I can only imagine the writer who's writing this letter. Most people think that it's Paul. There's a, there's must be an undertone of some sort of sexual sin. They don't go into much detail like they have in past chapters, but he, he kind of brushes past and says, Hey, keep yourself pure from sexual sin. Verse 16 of the last chapter, it said, be careful that no one takes part in sexual sin. I had that highlighted. And then here it even says, Hey, uh, you know, God will judge as guilty. Those who take part in sexual sin, he, he, he breezes past it, but he does mention it. There's this strong mention. So I'm, I'm guessing that the Hebrew church, just like most churches, if not all churches have some kind of issue with sexual sin. There's this carnality that plagues the church, right? We, we allow the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh to get the best of us. And even within marriages, even within, you know, relationships, people are shacking up and living with each other outside of marriage. People are having sex. They're saying that they, you know, they're, they're following and living for God yet. Uh, the way that they're actually living, they're speaking it, but their actions don't line up. There is judgment for that. There are consequences for your actions. Um, I made a post on Twitter yesterday that really, you know, it spoke to me, obviously, because I posted it, but it was a thought in passing. And uh, we talk about being persecuted, right? We talk about, um, we talk about being willing to die for Christ. And that was just it. So many people say, you know, oh, I'll die for Christ. I'll stand for Jesus. I would never renounce him. Yet they don't live for him. All right, let me say that again. There's a lot of people who say that they will die for Christ, but they haven't even began living for him. All right? How are you, how are you going to tell me that you're willing to die for his name when you can't even follow or obey the commands or the rules or, or live in the manner that he's calling us to live? Have you guys thought about that? That's heavy right? That's heavy. Oh, I'll die for them. If they ban Bibles, then I'm going to stand for them. You know, oh, I would, I, I would die for the name of Jesus. I would never reject him. Yet you never started living for him in the first place. Wow. That's heavy, right? And I know that that hits some of you guys. You're just like, dang, right? I can't even go a couple of days without looking at pornography, man. I can't even go without judging. I can't even go without, uh, you know, sitting here and being jealous. I'm still harboring unforgiveness. I'm sitting here saying that I'm a Christian, but I never, I haven't even started or begun to live for him. What makes me think that when times get hard, when, when stuff really hits the fan, when it comes to Christianity, how many, why, why do you think that you're going to stand strong for him when you can't even stand strong for him in your daily life with no persecution? I mean, but that's none of my business. I'm here trying to encourage you guys, lead by example, show you what it is in the field with you every single day. Um, that's what God put on my heart, a form of discipleship that looks unlike any other. You won't see, and I'm not saying that it's never done before, but a lot of pastors will only pop up on Sundays and maybe Wednesdays and throw you a sermon and kind of leave you hanging in between. But I'm here trying to walk with you guys every single day, showing you what it looks like, leading by example in the field with you. I want to see you guys victorious. I want to see you guys win. I want to really strengthen you and encourage you and really embolden you guys to walk in the power and authority that we have. You know what I mean? Like every single day, that's the goal here. Amen. So yeah, we kind of breeze right over that little bit. So again, this is practical teaching here. The writer saying, hey, keep loving each other. Welcome strangers. Marriages should be honored. Stay away from sexual sin. Verse five, keep your lives free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. That, that hit me. Uh, I think a lot of us aren't happy with what we have, right? We have these laundry lists of the things that we need, the things that we want, but we overlook the things that we have, right? Imagine, imagine walking with God over the last year and he's healing relationships. He's letting go of baggage. He's transforming your life. He's giving you the friends that you want. He's giving you these opportunities. He's working in your life. Anybody with two eyes could see that God is evident in your life, but here you are ungrateful, unsatisfied, discouraged, frustrated because things aren't going your way, right? That's how a lot of Christians live. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for transforming me. Thank you for helping me unpack this baggage. Thank you for giving me new friend groups, transforming my mind. Thank you, God, for walking with me, never leaving me or forsaking me, but it's just not enough, 
I'm still frustrated. I'm still discouraged. I'm still beat up. I'm still going through it in my mind. All right, I'm not here trying to guilt you. I'm not trying to shame you. Maybe that's you. But what I'm trying to do is get you to shift your perspective. Where's the gratitude? Where's the thankfulness? Where, where is that? When we sit in this seat of discouragement, when God is literally working in your life, be happy with what you have. Be happy with the life that you're living, the breath that you're breathing. If you're alive this morning and you got a phone and you're able to watch this on the replay live or listen to it on the podcast, you're blessed in a large percentage of the world. There's people who don't know what they're going to eat today. There's people who don't know where they're going to sleep that don't have the creature comforts of stepping into a kitchen, opening a cabinet or fridge and pulling out food to make. There's a lot of people we, we get so caught up. And that's I remember when the thing went around, the saying went around first world problems, right? That's a real thing that we, we, we have these first world problems and we allow our suffering to become greater than the suffering of others. We've become so ungrateful, so unthankful. And many times it, it takes us losing everything in order to re uh, gain that perspective. For me, it took me going to prison, man. I had to lose everything. I really did. And some might say, well, you didn't lose everything. No, but for the time being, man, I had three hots, a cot to sleep on. I had a little bit of money. I had some money coming in so I could buy some snacks and some extra stuff. But man, I was wearing, you got seven days in a week. You got three pairs of undies. You got to rotate, right? You got two pairs of jeans. You got to rotate. You got one pair of shorts. You got three shirts. And it's like when you lose everything and you're down to what the state's giving you, you start to look at life a little bit different. You start to realize that all of the things that you had and that you thought you needed, you really don't need to survive. All of that stuff is meaningless. When, when I was gone, all my stuff, you know, a lot of it was sitting in the closet collecting dust. Not my socks. My kids went in and raided my socks. I had some of the coolest stance socks. Like I was a guy who was into hats, socks, and shoes. I came back and my socks were gone. My kids had the dopest sock game. I was like, bro, what give like you just went in and took all of my socks? Like I came home and don't have any socks. You guys just took them all. It was crazy. I'm not at that big into socks anymore, but it was a thing. I was kind of sick. My heart hurt when I got home. I was like, man, I had all these cool socks. Now they got holes in them. Kids got their big toes sticking through my $16, $20 pairs of socks. I was like, come on, man. But at the end of the day, none of it matters, right? I'm glad that they got some use out of it. But it reminded me that, hey, I got to be satisfied with what I have. If I don't have it, I stand by this and we're going to dive more into it. If I don't have it, I don't need it, right? Let that sink in for just a moment. If you don't have it, you don't need it. God has a plan, a purpose, and a will for you today. Let's talk about this next 24 hours, right? You got 24 hours. So am I going to spend my 24 hours crying, wishing, being frustrated over things that I want? Or am I going to say, okay, I want some things that I don't have. But in the next 24 hours, is it? do I need it? For God's purpose and plan, do I need it? Okay, if God hasn't given it to me, I must not need it to fulfill his purpose and plan and will that he has for me for the next 24 hours. If it's something that I need, he's going to provide. If it's something that I need, it's going to show up. If it's something that I need to complete this day, this next cycle of breaths, then he's going to provide because he's Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. And if he's brought me to it, he's going to bring me through it. He's going to equip me and give me all of the things that I need to complete the plan, purpose, and will that he's created for me in this 24 hours. But what most people do is they spend their 24 hours looking off into the future, trying to rush through the day to get to what it is that they want. They don't realize that there's purpose, that there's a plan and that there's a will in this 24 hours. So if you don't have it, you must not need it for today. So let me get to business today. And when that thing comes, that is the perfect timing. It's God's timing. I'll get it when I actually need it. All right. David Rivera, you say you need coffee and prayer every day. Well, baby, we are here every day. And if you miss it, you can always catch the replays. I love that it says, it, it, it quotes two of my favorite Old Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy 31.6, you'll hear me quote this often. Um, it says, look, be satisfied with what you have. God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And, and that is an anchor scripture for me because there's been times in my life where I've felt alone. I've felt as if. 
Uh, I didn't have anybody, maybe in the physical, maybe I didn't have relationships because I isolated myself because I put my walls up because I didn't trust people. I wouldn't let people in. And so I would feel as if I was alone, not for a lack of people trying to be a part of my life, but a lack of me allowing people into my life. And so in those moments, I would feel so alone and isolated when I was the one who did the isolating, when I am the, I'm the one who did the pushing away because I didn't want to be vulnerable, put my walls down and allow people into my life for the fear of them rejecting me, hurting me, judging me, or, um, you know, just not liking me, right? There's this fear of judgment. And so I stood on this scripture, God will never leave me nor forsake me. So when I feel alone, when I feel like I don't have anybody, even though the reason I probably don't have anybody is because I've pushed everybody away. That's a message in a message. Um, I stand on this scripture. And then the next one is Psalm 118, six. So we can be sure when we say, I will not be afraid because the Lord is my helper. Right? People can't do anything to me. The Lord is my helper. He leads me. He guides me. He teaches me. He knows what's best. My father knows what's best. And he is here. I just I get this picture of me trying to ride a bike. And I got my little training wheels and my helmet that's far too big for my little head. And I'm like pedaling and I'm trying. I just feel like God's right there with me. He's got one hand on the handlebar, one on the back of the seat, and he's guiding me, man. And I think that I'm just going so hard. I'm doing all this work and he's just there guiding me, right? It's almost like when you're bowling with bumpers, you know, you just, you, you throw it down and it's heading to the gutter and it's like the little bumper goes, boo, and puts it back on track. And here it goes and boo, it hits the bumper and then boom, strike. And you're just like, I'm the best bowler in the world. And God's like, I'm so proud of you. I got the bumpers up and we're guiding that little little ball and you just you think you're doing the best you're gonna bowl 300 today son because I love you but I'm keeping you within the lane and he's there teaching us how to ride the bike and our little heads are shaking he's our helper man he's here for us he's guiding us he's leading us he loves us he cares about us so deeply so so deeply and it's us who gets mad it's us who gets frustrated when we don't get what we want and we jump to conclusions, we make assumptions. Well, God doesn't love me because he's not answering me. That's some weird stuff, man. It's so weird that we do that, that we think we know better than God. So if that relationship doesn't work out, even though you're praying for it, he's protecting you, he's redirecting you, or it's the consequences of your own decisions and actions. And we're trying to strong arm him into fixing something that's unfixable because we abused it in the first place. Right, that that's us is we will abuse and abuse and abuse a relationship and then when it is crumbling and crushed underneath our feet, we run to God to save it. It's like if we would have had that same energy in the first place, we wouldn't have abused it and crumbled it, right? And so we're and then we get mad, God, why won't you fix what I've broken? And he's like, Because you need to learn. Sometimes you need to learn. Will God fix things that we've crumbled and broken by his grace and mercy? Absolutely, if it's a part of his will. But, but there are consequences for our decisions. We will stomp people into the ground, treat them poorly. And when they've had enough, when they get fed up and they walk away and we start going, God, what, uh, keep them in my life. And he's like, why? You've treated them like a doormat. They deserve better than what you've been given them. Well, well, now I'm going to change. Now I'm going to change. And it's like, it's a little too late. It's a little too late. And I pray that you write this on your heart. I pray that you change. And now uh, let me change you and transform you. And now if you have the opportunity to get into a new relationship, I bet you're going to treat it better. I bet you're going to handle it better. I bet you're going to learn. You're going to grow. You're going to build it on the foundation of the truth. Sometimes it takes us losing everything in order for us to gain a little bit of knowledge. Because unfortunately, as human beings, many times we're hard-headed. We want what we want. Right, We think life is Burger King, have it your way. I don't even know what, is that Burger King's slogan? Have it your way? I don't even remember, but it's some slogan, right? Many of us, we want that. We want to have it our way. And, and, and if it's not our way, then God's not for us, right? If, if it's not our way, then God doesn't love us. If it's not our way, then, you know, he's trying to keep us from having the best. Like, come on, man. He's our father. He's our helper. He loves us. He's been trying to protect you. He's been trying to get a hold of you. He's been, you know, he's over here. You're trying to fight for your attention. You're completely distracted. Thank you, guys. I knew, I knew somebody knew what. It's Burger King. I appreciate that. Have it your way, right? God's over here he, trying to fight. The creator of the universe is trying to get our attention, trying to have a relationship with you. And you're over here selling them out for season four of Stranger Things. If, by the way, I have nothing against that. 
Um, and we don't need you to go, oh, well, it's demonic. It's all this. Calm down, right? I'm not, I'm, I have nothing against these shows. I just see so many people will put so much energy and effort into binge watching TV. There's a new Obi-Wan Kenobi, man. I'm a Star Wars guy. I love it. Um, there's three episodes out, I think, by now. I haven't had a chance to sit down and get into them. Like, there, we will spend so much time, energy, and effort on shows, on entertainment, on experiences, on travel. We'll spend all of this time, energy, and effort. And God, the creator of the universe is over here like, I would love to have a relationship with you. All right, I've numbered the stars in the sky. I've created everything. I've created you. And I would love, I would love to have a relationship with you. And we're just like, not now, man. Season four is on right now. You know, you want to know my heart? My heart right now is rooting for desperate house. Like, come on, people. Distractions, things pulling out our attention. It's all for a purpose. There's all a reason behind that because the enemy doesn't want you to walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be. He doesn't want you to have intimate relationship with God. And so, of course, this world is filled. It's filled with distraction. This world is filled with things that are trying to pull your eyes off of him. But he's our helper. Verse 7, I promise we're going to get through Hebrews. I, I promise you. Um, verse 7, remember your leaders who taught God's message to you. And now this is what's important, right? Remember how they lived and died. So remember your leaders. Who are your spiritual leaders? Who are the people who are walking with you? Where are you being fed? How are you being fed? Remember how they lived and died. Right, remember how they lived and died and copy their faith. Do what they're doing. Remember how they lived and died. Do what they're doing. For me, I see the apostles. I see the disciples. I see Jesus, the ones who I want to learn from. They weren't cruising around on private jets, right? They didn't have big, ridiculous mansions. They didn't drive 20 different cars. Um, and they were in the trenches and they loved people. And all of my favorite characters in the Bible were martyred. They were beaten. They were hung upside down. They were boiled alive. They were shipwrecked. They were in the trenches trying to spread the gospel, right? The gospel's for everyone. So when I look at that model of what it is to be a leader, it takes sacrifice, it takes discipline, it takes trust, it takes obedience, it takes focusing on God. Um, the direction that things are going or have been going when it comes to some of these mega churches, I think are, is a little off. Now, please don't get me wrong. Um, would I like to have a big home? Absolutely. Do I want to have a nice car that has no problems, not a big old crack in the windshield? Of course I do. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, do I enjoy taking trips? I would love to. I, I love that. I, I don't think that there's anything evil or wrong inherently with those things. But when it becomes the primary focus, when you're doing what you're doing in order for just financial gain, there becomes an issue. So don't follow me. Don't look, don't even look at me. I'm not saying, hey, I want you guys up at 4.30 every day. I don't want you up. I, I want you up. I want you on. That's not even what I'm saying. Look past me. Remember your leaders who taught you God's message. Remember how they lived and died. I'm still alive, so the verdict's still out on me. Um, you guys don't know how I, I'm gonna die. I want you to look at the. I want you to look at Jesus, right? That's I, I believe that's where we should be looking. That is where we should be looking. Look at Jesus. How did he live? Do what Jesus did. Copy what he did. Copy how he lived. How did he love? How did he teach? How did he interact with people? How did he present the message of truth and life? He did so with love. That's where we should be looking. Right? That's where we should be looking. Verse 8, my favorite. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9, do not, do not let all kinds of strange teachings lead you in the wrong way. Your heart should be strengthened by God's grace, not by obeying rules about foods which do not help those who obey them. Again, the writer speaking to the Jewish church, Judaism was really concerned and um, is wrapped up with a lot of do's and don'ts and tradition and man-made ideas and you can't eat this food, you can't eat that food, you got to do this on this day. There are certain rules and regulations and here, you know, this is... Uh, this is saying, hey, 
Your heart should be strengthened by God's grace. It doesn't come from obeying rules about foods which do not help those who obey them. Many times Christ said that it's not about the outside of your cup. It's the inside of your cup. I mean, even the Pharisees would go and they, the outside of their cup looked amazing. It was immaculate, right? Every hair was in place. They had the most uh, immaculate wardrobe. It was creased in the right places. Their belts were tied. You know, like they looked good. On the outside, it was this outward show and appearance of being religious, but inside their cup was filthy. I've shown you guys that before. I've shown you the inside of my cup. Um, not this one because it's super clean, but my old coffee and prayer cup, that thing was filthy, man. On the outside, it looks good. It looks immaculate, but I, I never washed the inside. And that's how a lot of people are. They're more concerned with the outer appearance and putting out that vibe of, oh, I'm a Christian. Look at the way that I live. Look at the things that I do. Look at my outer life. But in their heart, on their inside, they're filthy right? on the, They're harboring secret sin. They're sitting in judgment. Many times they're pushing away people who actually need their help. They're putting on a show, essentially. It, it's so much greater than that. So that's the, the atmosphere and the climate in which the, the church, the, the Hebrews that they were sitting in, they were, uh, they, they were coming out of Judaism where they were following these strict rules and this emphasis on an outer appearance and going through the checklist regardless of your heart posture. Right. So moving forward, I'm going to jump through. I'm going to jump up to um, <clears throat> verse 15. So through Jesus, let us always offer to God our sacrifice of praise. Um, I, I love this. A sacrifice of praise. You might be like, oh, but it's not a sacrifice to praise God. Sometimes it is when you're in a storm, right? I think that's some of the hardest places and hardest times to give God praise when you're in the middle of it. Imagine going through uh, a divorce and, and, and being broken and torn apart and like frustrated because things aren't being fixed or going your way, but still having the, the wherewithal to praise God in the middle of that. Imagine grieving, losing somebody who you were close to, maybe a, a loved one, maybe a child, maybe a spouse, maybe somebody really close, a best friend. And in the middle of that, still finding the strength to praise God. Right? I share that. Uh, I share that. One of my favorite songs is that song, and I'll praise you through the storm, man. I'll praise you through the storm, and I will lift my hands. Like even in the middle of of some of the hardest things, if we can find a position of praise, man, that is a sacrifice. Where you're laying down yourself on the altar, you're laying down ego, you're laying down pride. You hit those knees and you say, God, I don't understand. I don't know what I'm going through. I don't know why this doesn't make sense. But God, I know that you are good and that you are faithful and that all things work out for your glory. So I'm going to choose. I'm going to find this position of praise. I'm going to make the sacrifice of self and I'm going to give you the glory and the honor you deserve because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's challenging. It's not easy. But I believe that in those places, there's so much growth. There's so much revelation. There's so much power that comes from finding that position of praise in the middle of what you're going through. All right? In the middle of what you're going through. He says, so, th uh, so three, Jesus, let us always offer to God our sacrifice of praise, coming from the lips that speak his name. Verse 16, do not forget to do good unto others and share with them, because such sacrifices please God. Right? More practical living, more practical ideas. Hey, this is what I want you to do. Verse 17. Oh, <laughs> this is a good one. Obey your leaders and act under their authority. They are watching over you because they were responsible for your souls. I like this part. This is one of my favorite parts. Obey them so that they will do this work with joy, not sadness. It will not help you to make their work hard. Right? I love that. He's like, hey, stop being such a pain in the neck. Listen to what they're telling you to do because what, that, that way they can do what they're doing with joy and not so much sadness. Right? <laughs> you guys don't get that. Some of you guys are like, man, I'm, I'm sitting here like, gosh, man, this is the fourth relationship they've been in. And they're here asking for relationship advice. I keep telling them to stop getting in relationships. Focus on yourself. Focus on your relationship with Jesus. And you're like, oh, pastor, I got to talk to you again. About what? Oh, I'm going through heartbreak. It's the fourth time this year, bro. 
Are you kidding me? What, like every every three months you're in a new one? That does not bring me joy that we have to continuously go through and over these elementary situations. I'm over here, like I'm giving you advice. I'm leading you in scripture. I'm doing my best to walk with you and disciple you and help you. And here you are ignoring the advice that I'm giving you, completely turning your back on the word of God, scripture, and all confirmation that the Holy Spirit has for you. And you're finding yourself stuck in the same rut that you have been struggling with for the last 10 years. And yet here we are, God, pastor, I need your prayer again. It's for what? Please don't say it's the same thing. You you keep, there's a video of, a, a, I posted this before, the sheep that's stuck in this crack and, and you go in and, and the, the, the guy he pulls the sheep out and the sheep's like awesome. And he jumps like four jumps and then boom, right back in the crack. And it's just like, as a pastor, as a leader, as somebody in a position of authority, you see Christians were just like that, man. Uh, oh, Pat, yeah, they, that was a word that really spoke to me. Gosh, man, I really need to do better. And they walk outside the church. They forget it. They're already back on social media. They've completely like, oh, man, that was that really spoke to me. Like what part? Because you didn't apply any of it. And then you're right back in the world doing the same thing. That brings me zero joy. It brings me a lot of sadness because it's like, are they even listening? Do, are they, uh, are, I'm up late, I'm praying for people, for situations, they see a little breakthrough, they get the breakthrough, and then they're right back at the table of sin two days later, talking about, oh, I need your prayer, I need your prayer again. No, you need deliverance, you don't need my prayer, you need God to give you a quick swat on the butt with a two by four, because you're not getting it. You know what I mean? That's one of my, I like that verse, that's funny. Obey them so that they will do this work with joy, not sadness, right? It will not help you to make their work hard. Some of y'all out here making work real hard. I love you and I'm going to be here for you and I'm going to give you that prayer. But what tends to happen is that the love becomes a little bit tougher, right? After the third, the fourth time you're coming back for the same thing, um, there's still empathy, there's still grace, there's still kindness and gentleness, but the love becomes a little bit harder. Like, okay, okay, I could do permission to speak freely. <laughs> and they're, of course, pastor, say whatever it is. Like, okay, put your seatbelt on because I'm about to just, uh, we're going to take all formality out of the picture because at this point, the formality just ain't clicking with you. I'm going to have to tell you some hard truth with love, but we got to get to the bottom of this. Anyway, moving forward, verses 20 and 21. I love this um, because this is how we're going to close. There's, there's a couple of verses here uh, where the writer is saying that this is what he prays, right? This is, this is what he prays. I pray that the God of peace will give you every good thing you need so you can do what he wants. We just talked about this. I underlined needs. His prayer, he's saying to the church, I pray, okay? And so, so imagine me praying this for you. I pray that God will give you every good thing that you need so you can do what he wants. I want you, I pray that you have everything that you need. I pray that you have everything that you need, not everything that you want, because some of the things that you want would kill you. Some of the things that you want would spoil you. Some of the things that you want aren't what God wants for you. And we have to come to the realization that we don't always know what's best for us. Right? I, I come to the realization that I have kids and my kids, my children who I love and want to see thrive and prosper and become young men who are thriving in this world, making it a better place and making the name of Jesus more known. I understand that many times the things that they want, they don't need. Many times the things that they want will destroy them. Many times the things that they want, uh, they go against what I can see, right? It's easy to look into somebody else's life from an outsider looking in and be like, oh, that's not good for him, right? Oh, I, I, can, I can sit from my seat and go, wow, I see this person, the path that they're on, the way that they're veering, I can watch. It's almost like watching NASCAR, right? And it's just view, view, view. And you can see how people are swerving in and somebody's getting a little more gutsy and they're starting to get closer and closer. And it's like, you can see the wreck coming. You're like, oh man, if they keep this up, there's gonna be a wreck. 
And so it's the same thing. I can sit and I can watch my kids making choices and decisions or going in directions. And all I can do is warn them and be like, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, that's probably not the best decision. That's not the best choice. You're an adult. You're going to have to deal with those decisions and choices. There's consequences that come with those actions, but you're sitting there and you're watching and I can sit here and I can see that in people's lives. My prayer is not that you get what you want, but that you get what you need. And the things that you need are given to you for what? So you can do what he wants. You're not given what you need to make your life easier. You're not given what you need in order to make your life comfortable. You're not given what you need in order to uh, make yourself more known. You're given what you need so that you can do what he wants. When you start living in God's will and his plan and purpose, when you start executing and looking at life through his lens, you start understanding that everything that you have is for him. Nothing that you have is yours. You are a steward of all things and everything originates to him. Everything is his. My kids aren't mine. I'm a steward of these little souls and it is my responsibility to do the best job that I can to prepare them, equip them, lead them and guide them. God does with them as he pleases. If he wants to take them, then he takes them. If he wants to lead them, then he leads them. If he wants them to go somewhere, he takes them to those places. I've got to do my job, wash my hands and surrender them to the Lord because they are his in the first place. They are not mine. Same with our finances. Same with our jobs. Same with everything. Everything is his. And everything we have is what we need in order to do what he wants us to do. That's what it's about. It's not about us. But we live in the self-centered world. Everything is driven by self. Everything is revolving around self. It's about me, me, me. I, I, I. Me, I, me, I. It's all about me. Me, I, me, I, oh. Right? I pray that he will give you, that the God of peace will give you every good thing you need so you can do what he wants. The next one, um, same verse. I pray that God will do in us what pleases him. Through Jesus Christ and to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray that God will do in us what pleases him. I want God to do in you and in your life what pleases him. I want him to remove the people that you've brought into your life that aren't supposed to be there. That's what I want for you. I want him to do in you what pleases him. What were you made for? What did he create you for? We are searching for purpose. We are searching for peace, satisfaction, and comfort in this world, thinking that things, items, materials, experiences are going to bring us joy. You will not find true peace, true joy, true comfort, and purpose until you start being a vessel for him. That's what you were saved for. That's what you were saved for. It wasn't until I laid down everything. Man, you think I wanted to be a pastor That's not what I wanted. I had dreams and visions and goals of doing something completely different. And it wasn't until I said, you know what? This is, uh, it's very clear. I hear your voice. There's confirmation. This is what you are calling me to be. This is what you're calling me to do. And it wasn't until I got to the place where I laid it all down and said, okay, I'm yours. I'm done fighting. I'm searching for purpose and peace and love and comfort in this world. I'm coming up empty time and time again, over and over again. I, I, I don't have the answers. I can't do this without you. I lay it all down. Do with me as you please. Do with me what you created me to do, right? You created me for a purpose. Uh, He he made me for a reason. It's not for no reason. I'm not an accident. He made me and he made every single one of you for a purpose. When we surrender our life, we verbally say, God, I surrender. Do with me as you please. All of my dreams, goals, visions, and aspirations, they pale in comparison to what you have for me. Many times my visions, goals, dreams, and aspirations come from what this world has told me, sold me, and deceived me that will bring me joy and happiness. Many of our goals, visions, dreams, and aspirations are tied up with success according to this world, right? To be married, to have money, to have success, to have fame, to have clout, to travel, to have things, this kind of house, this kind of car. These are all illusions that are sold to us from a very young age that tells us that will bring us peace, happiness, purpose, and and the satisfaction that we're so desperately longing for. But if that was the case, then why are so many rich and famous people killing themselves in such large amounts? 
amounts? Why are so many of them struggling in divorce? Because they're searching for something. They have everything at their fingertips, yet none of it brings them peace, satisfaction, or happiness. And so they continually search. They have a new spouse. They change spouses. They change and jump through marriages as if they're changing their undergarments, right? They're doing all of these things that are extravagant, bigger, better. They have people waiting on them hand and foot, yet none of them seem to find peace, happiness, or satisfaction. It, it, that should be the greatest indicator. And yet, even in the face of all of that, we still long and yearn for that. We still want what they have. What they have is being miserable, being empty, being broken, being hurt, constantly searching for these things. And many of them have achieved the very goals, visions, and dreams that you're chasing after, yet none of them seem to have found peace, happiness, joy, or purpose. We are a silly little being, aren't we? We're silly little creations. It's funny that we can see the poo the proof in the pudding right before our eyes, yet we still long for those very things. Well, maybe it's different. Well, if I had that amount of money, I would do things differently. If I had that spouse, if I did that, if I went to that place, if I did this, I would be different. Would you? Who are you lying to? No, you would not. You better stop. No, you wouldn't. You'd be in the same position because some of these people are so rich and have so much success that they don't even need God. They are gods to themselves. They're their own gods. They've created that. So I just, I guess I'm in this place. My prayer is the same prayer, man. I pray that God will do in us what pleases him through Jesus Christ, that we would come to the realization that we are not our own, that we were saved for a price and saved for a purpose. And that purpose is to be vessels for the Holy Spirit to use our breaths that we breathe to make him more famous and more known, right? Uh, that we would be the hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears, the body of Christ. And all that we do would be to bring him glory and honor, that, that he would be able to use us where we are without grumbling, without complaining, without sadness, that we would hold tight to the truth of where we are going, what our hope is. We are aliens. We are foreigners. We are strangers in this land. This is not our home. This is not our final destination. And so we are here. We've been dropped off in this place. We've, given, we've been given the divine revelation of who Jesus is. And now he's downloading the blueprint of what he wants from each of us. Now, many of you are holding on to it. You're catching it. You're saying, yes, that's what it is. That's what life truly is. That's what it's about. And some of you are hearing it, right? It talks about the parable of the seed. Some of it's landing on fertile soil, fertile ground. It's taking root and it's going to be applied in your life. And you're going to see fruit that's being bore from the word that's being dropped right now. But some of you, it's landing on rough ground. And so it, it will take seed, but it's, it's going to take root, but it's not going to go very deep. And the cares and the worries of this life is going to scorch it up and it's going to uproot it. Some of this is landing among the weeds, right? That's strangling out that seed. And some of it's falling on a hard rock. Some of you are here and you're just like, ah, you're still unsure. You're just kind of like, you're still trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. But that's the parable of the seed and it's happening right now. Some of you, this word is just like, it's eye opening. It's mind blowing. This is transformational. This is truth. And for some of you, it, it, it makes sense, but you're having a hard time applying it. You can't quite seem to see how you're going to be able to break off some of these friendships or to go to, to let go of some of these things that are holding you back. I, I just, the last thing I want to say about Hebrews, um, is is this what did it what did it say yesterday yesterday in, in chapter 11 um man this was good in chapter 11 it said this um man where was it i'm trying to find the place where it says to let go of those things to walk away, to let go of all of the things that are holding us, to turn our back on it. Anyway, I had it highlighted, but I can't find it. Huh. Yeah. Anyway, I guess, uh, yeah, we did 12 yesterday. Anyway, the idea is we have to let go of, we got to put behind us a lot of the things that we're holding on to. We got to let go of the past. We got to let go of some of these strongholds, some of these bondages. 
Um, some of us are staying rooted in our trauma. Some of us are staying in the environments, the very environments that God's calling us out of. Uh, we talked about faith the other day in Hebrews 11. And I think that's where it was, um, is that we got to put beside those things. We've got to step out. We might not know where we're going, but we got to let go of those things. We got to move forward. Um, man. Faith, faith means being sure of things we hope for and knowing that something is real, even if we don't see it. We've got to leave behind the, the old and we got to step into the new. So that's what I want to encourage you guys. I want to encourage you. Let's talk about Genesis uh, chapter 24, for just a brief minute. And then I want to do an altar call. I feel the Holy Spirit. There's people who are ready to make a decision for Christ today, right now. And so I don't want to delay. I don't want to hold that back. I don't want them to miss the opportunity to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's what we're going to do today. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, chapter 24 of Genesis. I'm, I'm going to just breeze through it. It's, it's a love story. You know what I mean? Um, a bride is found for Isaac. So Abraham's getting old. And he calls over his oldest servant of his house who rules over everything that he has. And he's like, hey, make me a promise that Isaac finds a wife, not from the land that I'm in, but from the land that I'm from. And I want him to be from our lineage. I want him to be a part of uh, her to be a part of the family. And so the servant swears that I'm going to make that happen. And if I can't, if that person doesn't come back with me, then I'm free for Then he's free from the oath. So he grabs 10 camels, some servants, and he travels all the way back there. And uh, he lays down a fleece ideally, kind of like he says, okay, Lord, um, the, the woman who comes out and gives me water and also the 10 camels is going to be the one. The very first person that comes out is Rebecca. She comes out, she gives the servant some water. She says, drink my Lord. He drinks. As soon as he's done drinking, she goes, well, hold on a second. Let me fetch some more water and let me, let me, let me get those camels uh, some water too. So then she feeds all the camels. And in that moment, he's just like, this is her. Puts some bracelets on her, slaps them on her, puts the gold ring on her nose. She runs back home and tells everybody her brother comes out and is just like, hey man, don't just stay here. Come back to the house. We've got straw for the camels. We've got a place for you to rest. He gets there and he's just like, hey, first, before I eat, let me, sh let me share with you guys what's going on. I'm a servant of Abraham. He sent me over here looking for a wife for his son, Isaac. Um, before I got here, I started praying and said, God, if uh, reveal to me who it is and this is what's going to happen. And lo and behold, here came Rebecca and she did exactly what I prayed to God for. So, you know, can we have your daughter? And they're just like, well, let her wait for 10 days. And he said, well, ask her, maybe she'll come back. And she says, no, I'm ready to go. So she goes back with, um, with the servant. And as soon as she gets there, she's coming in on the camels. Isaac's out there praying. He sees her in the distance. She sees him. Love story, man. It's just this this beautiful love story of Isaac and Rebecca. It was ordained by God. There was all of this great stuff. I love it. You guys are reading this on your own, okay? What stood out to me, this is weird, is that this man, this servant doesn't even have a name. The servant doesn't even have a name, but he's a powerful figure. He is Abraham's right-hand man. This man... His name isn't even mentioned in the Bible at this point. He's the oldest servant of his house. Man, he's been with Abraham. It says that Abraham was old, well advanced in age. We understand that from the last chapter when Sarah died, Abraham was 137 years old. Abraham's been having servants. So this servant, right? This servant was here and he rules over everything that Abraham has. Not Isaac, not the son, not the heir, but this older servant, he has been with Abraham from the jump. And it says that he ruled over all that he had. Then the servant took 10 of his masters, this is verse 10, took 10 of his master's camel to departed for, his, for all of the master's goods were in his hand. This individual had power over Abraham's everything. Abraham, the father of our faith, Abraham, the who, who really initiates this lineage for us to have a savior, Abraham, uh, who's a man after God's heart, who has been given these promises. Here's this servant who doesn't even have a name, doesn't even have a name and is over everything that uh, Abraham has. 
it just blows my mind that what we would do is we would deem this individual important, right? He's the, he's the head dude. He is the guy. Like he has power over money and finances. He rules over everything. Yet we don't even know his name. He has no name. It reminds me that what God deems important and what we deem important are completely different. They're completely different. He didn't, they didn't even mention who he was except for he was a servant. And he ruled over Abraham, uh, all of Abraham's stuff. It reminds me that we need to have a lens that we look at life in the same way that Jesus looks at life. It's not about things. It's not about materials. It's not about position. It's not about title. It's not about any of those things. It's about your heart posture. You can have millions of followers yet be leading them to a place of death, darkness, and despair. You can have millions of dollars and not use them to help other people. God's not impressed by title. God's not impressed by position. God's not impressed by authority or uh, where you're at. God wants your heart. He wants your heart. That was random. I don't know even how scriptural that is. I saw that and I was just like, wow, this, this guy's got a lot of position. He's got a lot of power. He's able, like he's Abraham's right hand man. He entrusts the, the finding of his son, the heir to everything that he has, um, this duty to this man. And they don't even care to mention his name. It wasn't even important enough. Just something to think about, food for thought. I could be missing by a hundred miles, but that stuck out to me and spoke to me. So right now I want to switch gears completely. Look, if you're on this live, understand we've done this for 222 days in a row, 222 days in a row. We've read one chapter from the new Testament, one chapter from the old Testament. We've had hundreds of people get saved here on coffee and prayer. Glory to God. It's not by anything that we do. It's not because of anything special. It's because of Jesus. He has led you here for a reason, right? It's not a coincidence that you're on today's live. Maybe you don't even know why you're here. You're like, why am I here? God wants you to know that he loves you. He cares about you and he has a plan, a purpose, and a will for your life, right? 222 days in a row we've shown up and today you chose this day to be here. Maybe you didn't know that we were doing a digital altar call. Maybe you did and that's the reason why you came. Today, I don't want you to go another day without knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity, everybody on this call, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or maybe you've been backslid, maybe you're unsure of where you would go, where you would spend eternity if you were to die today, I want to tell you this. First, I want to share the gospel with you. The gospel is good news. We are all sinners. Do you guys understand that? And our sin separates us from God. In order for us to have access to God, a sacrifice had to be had. And Jesus was that one time, perfect, unblemished, pure sacrifice once and for all. He laid down his life. There's no greater love than a brother who will lay his life down on the line for another. He laid his life down on the line. His perfect, unblemished life. God came in the flesh, out of heaven, out of perfection. He left the comfort of the palace in order to come down and to identify with us so that he could be a living sacrifice so that we could have access to God and that we wouldn't have to spend an eternity separated from him. That is the gospel. You guys, that is good news. We believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life and that nobody enters into heaven. Nobody goes to the Father except for through Jesus, who is our most high priest, who has gone into the most holy of places and sits at the right hand of God for eternity. Now, if that's you, you want to receive this free gift of salvation. I want to encourage you right here, right now. I want you to put in the chat, I want to be saved. That's what we want. I, I believe that there's at least one person here on this live that wants to be saved, that wants to receive the free gift of salvation. If that's you, I want you to put in the chat, I want to be saved. In front of this cloud of witnesses, there's 480 people on here. Uh, we want to witness you receive the free gift of salvation. Right there, amen. There's at least one. The free gift of salvation. And we want to welcome you into the family of believers. Don't be ashamed. Don't be nervous. Don't be scared. You're in a safe place where uh, you have brothers and sisters from around the world who are going to enter into prayer. We're going to pray for you. And we're going to lead you in uh, just a very small, a small prayer, um, asking and inviting Holy Spirit to be a part of your life. 
Um, and then from there, we're going to invite you to come back every single day to learn more about Jesus, to learn more about community, to fellowship with us. I want to invite you to our Bible study that we have Thursday nights. I want to invite you, if you're a man, to our men's group that we have on Tuesday nights. I want to be a part of your life. I want to be a part of your daily walk with Jesus. Understand that we do this every day, and if you miss it, you can catch the replay or you can catch the podcast. Lots of opportunities. Amen. So if that's you and you want to be saved, I want you to say this. I want you to say, God, my sin separates me from you. I understand that I'm in need of a savior because of my sin. Right now, I receive the free gift of salvation. I invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life and the savior of my soul. I want the Holy Spirit to dwell within me. I believe that Jesus Christ is the way the truth, and the life. And nobody goes to the Father except for through Him. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I believe that I now have the power and authority and boldness to walk just as Jesus walked. To tear down strongholds. To be an enemy of the devil, to stand on his head. Mm. I want to be saved. I receive the free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The enemy has tried to stop you from being here. The enemy has tried to prevent you from receiving the free gift of salvation. The enemy hates you, right? We are now enemies of the world, right? As we follow Christ, we are in, a, we are in opposition. We are in conflict with this world. The philosophy, wisdom, and ways of this world stand, uh, they stand against scripture. They stand against truth. And I want to welcome you all to what I want to call uh, the family of believers. You are now a part of the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you guys to come back here daily to be fed, to be discipled, to be led, um, and to really share in what we're doing here. Amen. I love it. I love to see it. So let's pray. Let's get up out of here. I know you guys got stuff to do. Um, glory to God. Some people are saying 16. Some are saying 20. I don't know, man. I, I just know that more than 15 people gave their, their lives to Jesus this morning. Um, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I'm okay with the conflict, man. I'm okay with it. And that's all right. Bring it on. Because I know who wins. I know how the story ends. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the time that we got to spend here this morning. We want to thank you for the bold souls that stepped up and in front of everybody uh, asked to be saved, um, that put their faith and trust in you, that received the free gift of salvation. We just pray that as they leave this place, you would be with them. We know that you are, that you would go before them. We know that you have and that you would never leave them nor forsake them as we know that you won't. God, we stand on your truth. We stand on your promises. God, that is the anchor to our souls. That is the firm foundation on which we build our lives is your truth is your word. As we leave this place, continue to give us opportunity to spread the gospel, to share the good news, and to tell people about your son, Jesus. Help us to operate with a sense of urgency, knowing that the world that we live in is uh, it's perishing right before our eyes, that we are not promised tomorrow, and that the breath that we breathe is a gift. Help us to use that gift in a manner that brings glory and honor to your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I love you guys. Um, I honor you. I'm, I'm so, so thankful that uh, you guys decided to join me this morning. And I look forward to starting a brand new chapter. We're starting James, I believe, tomorrow morning. So um, great time to invite your friends or your family members. We're starting James. James has popped up over the last couple of days. Heavy. I've heard people quote James 1 and James 4 in the last couple of days. So I'm anticipating that James is going to be a game changer. It's going to bring some fire. There's a lot of practical information and a lot of great uh, just scripture to build our lives on. So anyway, love you guys and I'll see you tomorrow.